And so I'm very optimistic that uh, within the, the coming five to 10 years, uh, we, we will see ourselves very, very much more closely aligned with Europe at the minimum, probably in the single market. And I would imagine, given that it's just not logical to be part of the single market without being a rule maker as well as a rule taker, that we will be back in the EU. I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today we're going to be talking with Professor A.C. Grayling about the subject of Brexit. We're very lucky to have him as a, a guest. He's a very prominent philosopher and historian of ideas. And he's always been somebody who thought that um, philosophy and action, political and public action, should go together. He's been associated with a number of public causes. One of the causes he's most associated with at the moment is Brexit and its desirable reversal, as he sees it. And that's what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. Once again, Professor Grayling, thanks for joining us. Uh, we've had a turbulent year in, in 2022. We're at the beginning of 2023. Do you think that year has brought nearer the reversal of Brexit or, or the contrary? Uh, yes, I do. And I do rather emphatically think that it has, because there's been a very marked change in the public conversation, in the conversation in the press. And I think uh, filtering through into the uh, political domain where our politicians have been, as it were, frozen in terror, the fault that uh, the, um, the red wall voters of the blue wall voters uh, wouldn't tolerate any further discussion about our relationship with the EU. But I do think things have changed. And I think recent polling data, and consistently over the last year and more, in fact, the um, proportion of people asked increases all the time as to whether Brexit was a mistake, whether it was the right thing to do, whether people would be happy to see another referendum. And as we speak today, and we're, we're talking uh, in the middle of January 2023, the polling data tells us that about two thirds of people would like to see another referendum on EU membership. In The uh, Economist, in the FT, in The Guardian, and even now in The Telegraph, The Times, uh, always has been the case, of course, in The Independent, uh, you begin to see marks of, of um, displeasure with the way Brexit is turning out. Uh, there is a, an increasing and, and much, much more determined sense that it was indeed a very bad mistake and that it should be revisited. At very, very least, if it's not a, a, a question at the moment, and we'll discuss this shortly, about actually rejoining in full, at very least now the same days, that we should be part of the single market. Is it possible to sketch out a, a political um, timeline, a scenario, whereby we might rejoin the European Union? It, it seems quite difficult to work out now how, in terms of elections and party activity, that, that might come into being? Yes, at the moment, it does look uh, um, not, not just uh, difficult, but even improbable, given that the two main political parties, Conservatives and Labour, both seem to be Brexit parties now, uh, very disappointingly in the case of Labour, of course, and the uh, complete reversal, the U-turn by Starmer on questions of single market membership and the freedom of movement. So that, that, that's very, very disappointing at the moment. However, Things turn on a sixpence in politics. Things can change very quickly. A week can be a very long time, as we know, in, politi in politics. And um, things can change very rapidly. And it, it seems to me that there is a very plausible route indeed, um, which is as follows, that at the next election, the result is a hung parliament. This very large poll lead that Labour has at the moment over the Conservatives will diminish but even the lead that it has at the moment doesn't guarantee an overall majority for the Labour Party. And so it begins to look as though the likelihood is that there will be a hung parliament. A hung parliament will result in a coalition government, or at very least uh, there having to be an agreement, uh, you know, comfort and supply kind of uh, agreement with whatever the lead party is in parliament. And a, a, um, a, a hung parliament will be much, much more receptive to a major campaign to have another say on Europe. So that, that is a, a very plausible route. And it seems to me that even if um, the hung parliament itself weren't uh, prepared to do that, it would almost certainly introduce PR. Uh, proportional representation is a very, very significant um, need. We need it. Uh, we, it's a, a, an essential reform in our uh, political um, and uh, constitutional structures in this country. And if we did have a PR elected parliament, 
that parliament would almost certainly have the sufficient degree of rationality to think again about our relationship with Europe. Europe. And so I'm very optimistic that uh, within the, the coming five to 10 years, uh, we, we will see ourselves very, very much more closely aligned with Europe at the minimum, probably in the single market. And I would imagine, given that it's just not logical to be part of the single market without being a rule maker as well as a rule taker, that we will be back in the EU. Um, do you regard the um, joining the single market, joining the customs union, either or both, um, as being plausible halfway houses? Um, you talked about the difficulties that um, they would bring with themselves in the long term. Um, are they even politically saleable in the short term, do you think, as, a, as an intermediate step towards rejoining? Yes, I do think they are, are plausible. And, and not just that, but I think likely. You know, I, I think with the tentativeness of our political culture at the moment and the accumulating facts about the harm being done to our economy and to our world standing um, as a result of Brexit, that the, the, the first step will very, very likely be to much, much closer alignment. And, and that will in, in effect mean uh, having to be uh, an, at very least an adjunct member, if not a full member of the single market. And the reason for it is, of course, that a, a very, very large 27 state uh, economic union um, will not tolerate uh, lowering standards to allow somebody to cherry pick it, its relationship with the EU. I mean, one of the great things about the EU, of course, is that it raises standards all around the world with anybody that wants to trade with it. Uh, and, and this is an excellent aspect of, of the EU. And it's not going to, you know, it's not going to mitigate that in any way or, or diminish that. And therefore, any closer alignment with the EU, uh, with, this, with the market uh, of, of the EU is going to mean de facto um, membership of, of the single market. And if you're going to be in any way associated with it, why not be fully part of it? And I think that is the rational uh, approach. And I think very probably that's what's going to happen. And I think sooner rather than later. Do you think the rest of the EU would be be willing either to have us back as rejoin for, for new members or rejoined members, or, or even to come to an arrangement that was um, uh, as favourable as people hope about the internal market and um, the customs union? There is a lot of yes, resentment, a lot of resentment in the European Union. Well, there, there is resentment in some quarters, but there's also a lot of enthusiasm in uh, the European Parliament and in the Commission and in a number of the uh, member states for the United Kingdom to rejoin. I think the key issue is whether or not the member states of the EU feel confident that public sentiment and uh, political commitment is such in the UK that uh, it's not going to be disruptive um, uh, having them back in. Maybe, it may be that um, the essential uh, thing is reform of our own electoral system here and some constitutional safeguards against a very small activist group of people like the ERG on the far right of the Conservative Party, for example, uh, hijacking the process and, and forcing uh, the issue that we've had. Because if you look at the at the whole Brexit story, you see that, that, that it is a sort of horror show in a way from a constitutional point of view. Given that the um, the vote back in 2016, the Leave vote, was 37% of the total electorate. Now, in almost no other constitutional order would that be anywhere near sufficient for such a major change in the direction of a country and its economy and its and in its uh, arrangements. And so, uh, the, the member states of the EU might wish to say, well, a condition of a uh, full membership, at any rate would be you know, some uh, examination of the arrangements that you have, the electoral arrangements and the kinds of, of uh, minimum requirements, threshold or supermajority requirements for any major change. And that would put it in, uh, put the UK into alignment with other um, member states and they would be a safeguard for other member states in readmitting us. Or, although you're right that there, there is some resentment in some quarters, I think there's a great deal of enthusiasm for us to uh, re rejoin and for good reason. You know, behind the scenes, uh, all the years that we've been members of the EEC and the EU, 
the um, d despite the fact that there's been a lot of public noise from the far right and the far left opposed to EU membership, we, the UK, have been major contributors to very, very much of the development in the, in the uh, EU in matters of detail of policy. We've helped to build the single market. I mean, Mr. Thatcher, for all that the Conservative Party now is in a, an entirely new and different party from what the Conservative Party used to be, but I mean, Mrs. Thatcher was one of the chief uh, engineers in, in a way of the of the single market and was a big believer in it. And indeed, all our political leaders until very recently, um, until they, we've had some escapees, as it might be, from, from uh, institutions, um, have uh, you know held the rational view that uh, we would very much like to be a part of the EU story. Maybe not uh, at this juncture or in the near term of... Uh, very much closer political ties. That has been, I think, the sticking point here. But that anyway, I I even among our other European friends and, and partners, uh, is something for the slightly longer term future. I am myself, by the way, I'm personally very committed to the idea of a, of a federal Europe ultimately, but I see that it does need, you know, a, a cautious uh, and uh, well-built approach. And at the moment, the kind of contribution that the big UK economy and um, the energy that we put into our EU membership, contribution we've made, if our EU partners could be confident that uh, the political process wasn't going to derail it again, then they would have us back in for that reason. Yeah. And just make the, the point in, in passing, I've worked for Lord Cofield uh, in the implementation of the single of single market program, and it was perfectly clear to me that Mrs. Thatcher didn't understand all the political implications of the single market. So that's one of the difficulties that I think she bequeathed to the Conservative Party, um, which has found its its poisonous fruit in more in more recent years. Um, just before we finish, can, can you you say a word about Scotland and, and Northern Ireland? How far do you think they are going to be affected by? What, what you see as being a, a five or 10 year timetable for our rejoining the European Union? Well, I, I think uh, pressures on the rest of the UK from those two quarters will actually be rather helpful from the point of view of getting back into the EU, because both Northern Ireland and Scotland are very much in favour of being part of, of the EU. And the risk to the union overall from the Brexit process uh, has been uh, dramatically increased uh, as a result of it. I mean, the, the um, pressure in Scotland to detach from the UK and join the EU is, is now uh, looks irresistible, especially with recent events in which the UK Parliament is denying the decision of a cross-party uh, majority in the Scottish Parliament to introduce a, a law there, the, the, the gender recognition law. So uh, it seems to me that, that the destructive aspect of Brexit on the union of the UK uh, will be something that ultimately will result very probably in weakening of ties within the UK, perhaps the independence of Scotland, perhaps the reunification of the North and South and Ireland, although there are of course many uh, questions there too. But if those things were to happen, leaving a sort of England and Wales outside everything in, in Europe, uh, it would make it a very, very, very much harder to sustain that. And I think we can hope and expect that um, the wiser heads north of the, of the wall will uh, have the effect of dragging us back into sanity here too. Yeah. Final question. Uh, if within the period that you hypothesize we're back in the European Union. Um, what sort of a country do you think we will be then and in the future? What sort of um, uh, long-term aspirations do you have for, for a country purged of Brexit? Uh, well, I'm, I'm optimistic in a way because I think, uh, you know, it, it has been a, a cliche, but like a lot of cliches, true, that um, the, the UK, you know, having lost an empire and not found a role and so on, I mean, all those sorts of points made about us. I think Brexit is, uh, as it were, the convulsive, uh, you know, it, it's a sort of fit that, that we've had because we've, we, we've been in this dilemma about ourselves and about who we are and what we are in the world, where we should be, how we should, uh, you know, see ourselves. Uh, and um, may maybe this is that sort of convulsive moment where, at long last, 
the dreams of the past cease to be uh, an inhibition on our um, sensible ways of thinking about the future. And also, you know, it, it, the insularity that, that we've always suffered from uh, has been not just a, a literal insularity, but, but a, an historical one in the sense that we haven't really felt enough, apart from the one terrible experience of being blitzed in the second world, but we haven't experienced enough what our, our kinfolk in the rest of Europe have experienced over the centuries. There's devastating wars and conflicts and divisions. And, and you know, the, the founding fathers of the Steel and Coal Union and, and, you know, the originators of the whole European project were at long last uh, and blessedly determined to stop that and to change the course of history in Europe, to capitalize on everything that's good about it. And there is such a, a richness of what's good about uh, European culture and history. Uh, and to get away from these terrible internecine, the civil conflicts in a way between the peoples of, of Europe. And this sets a wonderful model for the world too, the, the model of, of soft power, of unity, cooperation, progress of standards. And this is a wonderful model. And you think of the other two great centers of power in our world today, the United States and, and China, and they are fundamentally sort of 19th century countries who still think of military power and influence and, and so on as the way to go. And that hasn't been the model with uh, uh, the EU. Uh, I would be a little sorry to see the EU begin to be more militaristic in its thinking because of the extremely bad behavior of Russia. But uh, um, the, 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 the sort of major thing about the EU as a, as a model for how the world should go that is the important thing. And this is why we see, for example, countries in South America, in Africa, in the Asia Pacific region, trying to imitate some aspects of the EU by getting, you know, a, a sort of kind of common market arrangements and, and some joint uh, standards and, and uh, uh, connections between them. After all, it was said by Cobden and Bright in the middle of the 19th century, it was said by Tom Paine at the end of the 18th century, that the way to achieve peace is to so intimately integrate trading relationships that you cannot afford to go to war with one another. And this, this has been one of the great principles of the EU. Let us, let us be so intimately united that we simply cannot do harm to one another. Well, that's a very good um, thought on, on which to end. And um, perhaps a reference to insularity inspires me to, to say that sometimes it's not just insularity, it even verges on solipsism within this country, that um, we think our country is the only one that really exists in the world. Um, and the European Union is a, a very good antidote to that. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, just to say to our listeners that we have on the Federal Trust website uh, a number of similar videos on Brexit and other topics which I hope will be of interest to you. And once again, thank you very much indeed, Professor Grayling. I'm sure many people will listen with great interest to, to the podcast.